Hi everyone, this lesson is on trochanteric bursitis. So we're going to talk about what this condition is, some of the causes of this condition. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So trochanteric bursitis is also known as greater trochanteric pain syndrome. It is a condition involving inflammation of the trochanteric bursa. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk about the pathophysiology in the next slide. So the trochanteric bursa is located on the lateral hip. And this is where we're going to see issues with trochanteric bursitis. And although it is known as trochanteric bursitis or greater trochanteric pain syndrome, it may not only be the trochanteric bursa that is affected. It may be other components of the hip that may be affected. And we're going to, again, talk about this in the next slide. Let's talk about the associations and potential causes of this condition. So some of the associations and causes of trochanteric bursitis include the following. Running, so running especially on banked surfaces. So if one leg is running on a lower surface than the other leg, and this is occurring over a consistent period of time, this is a potential cause of this condition. We can also see this condition more likely to occur after having surgery on the lateral hip, after having falls or injuries to the lateral hip, having leg length discrepancy. So if one leg is longer or shorter than the other leg, that can also increase the likelihood of having greater trochanteric pain syndrome. So this again ties in with running on bank surfaces, that discrepancy in leg length or leg length usage. And then other particular hip anatomical features can also play a role in increasing the likelihood of having this condition as well, including having a greater trochanter of the femur that is actually larger than average. This is also another potential related factor that can increase the likelihood of having this condition. So trochanteric bursitis is a relatively common condition. It is estimated to affect anywhere from 5 to 15% of the general population. Females are going to outnumber males with this condition. So this condition affects females more than males. And as we will see later, this condition can be either unilateral or bilateral, which means that it can be either one-sided or both sides being affected. So unilateral greater trochanteric pain syndrome or unilateral trochanteric bursitis is going to be more common than bilateral. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of trochanteric bursitis. So as this name implies, it is a condition involving inflammation of a bursa that is located superficially to the greater trochanter of the femur. So this would be Inflammation of a bursa, meaning that it would be bursitis. So the greater trochanter, if we were to look at the hip here, this would be the ball and socket joint of the hip. So this would be the head of the femur. And this bony protuberance or bony prominence is the greater trochanter. This is where that bursa is going to be located, right superficially to the greater trochanter. Now, what are bursa? So bursa are sacs that are composed of synovial membrane and filled with synovial fluid. And they are mostly going to be located at bony prominences. So we can find them at the greater trochanter. We can see them at the knees and we can also see them in the elbows. And they are there for a particular reason. They're there to act to reduce friction. So as tendons and muscles move along the bony prominence, there's this little sac that contains this synovial fluid to help reduce friction. So this is what these bursa are there for. Now, having said that, even though this condition is known as trochanteric bursitis or otherwise known as greater trochanteric pain syndrome, other bursa may be affected. So it may not be the bursa that overlies the greater trochanter. There may be other bursa that are affected that are actually causing this condition. Some of them include the subgluteus medius bursa, subgluteus minimus bursa, and subgluteus maximus bursa. So these other bursa that are located in and around the greater trochanter can also be inflamed and lead to this condition of greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And even other hip components may also be affected as well. Some of these can include muscle tendons, so muscle tendons in this area of the greater trochanter. So this could be inflammation of those tendons leading to tendonitis or an abnormal condition of the tendons, so tendinosis or some tendinopathy, some disease of the tendons. Trigger points of the muscles, which are hypersensitive spots on muscle, may be leading to pain that we can see in this condition. Some injury or muscle tear can be associated with this condition. We can also see localized issues to tissues surrounding or near the greater trochanter. And all of these potential anatomical issues that can cause greater trochanteric pain syndrome are due to single or multiple episodes of trauma that lead to inflammation of the trochanteric bursa and or 
those other surrounding structures. So just to make it clear again, although this condition is known as trochanteric bursitis, it's also known as greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And it may not only be the trochanteric bursa that is affected, it may be some other structures that are in that same area, which could cause this condition to occur. So this is a reason why this condition can be called greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Now let's talk about the clinical features of this condition. So the hallmark finding in this condition is a sharp localized pain on the lateral hip surface. So it's going to occur over or at the greater trochanter. So if you were to feel this area, you can feel this bony prominence that is the greater trochanter. And this is where the pain in this condition is going to be localized. As mentioned earlier on, it's possible that this condition can be unilateral or bilateral, unilateral being one-sided, bilateral being both sides, although unilateral greater trochanteric pain syndrome is going to be more common. And the pain may radiate, so it's going to be localized at or around the greater trochanter, but it can radiate down the thigh, so it can radiate along the lateral thigh on the same side, the ipsilateral side, where that focal point of pain at the greater trochanter is located. And it can be elicited by a variety of activities, including lying on the affected side or hip, weight bearing. So just standing, putting a lot of weight on your legs can cause pain to occur in that greater trochanter area. Walking, running, these other activities can also lead to pain in this area as well. And then passive external rotation of the hip can also induce pain. And then the onset of this condition can either occur suddenly, so it can be acute onset, or it can occur insidiously. It can come and go, it can occur very slowly, and over time the patient will then notice that they have this pain at the greater trochanter area. So these are all important clinical features to make note of in trochanteric bursitis or greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose this condition. So this is going to be a clinical diagnosis, and it's going to be clinically diagnosed by reproducing that hallmark lateral hip pain. So when the clinician actually palpates or touches, puts pressure over the greater trochanter, that pain can be reproduced. That's going to be a hallmark finding for the clinical diagnosis of this condition. This pain can also be reproduced by passive external rotation of the hip. So that can also be something that can be noted as well. And if there's any groin pain or referred knee pain, this may indicate another condition. There's not going to be actual hip pain, which would be noted as groin pain for the patient. It's going to be only on the lateral hip, right over the greater trochanter that may spread down the lateral thigh, but that pain should not extend past the knee down to the lower leg. That would indicate another condition. Plain radiography may be used in some cases to exclude other conditions, including a fracture or degenerative arthritis, if that is considered something that may be causing the pain. So how do clinicians actually treat this condition? Relative rest is going to be important for these patients. Because this condition is often due to repetitive physical activity like walking, running, or some other issue like a fall, it can be important to rest and allow the area to heal. Ice application over the area is going to be important as well. Use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs like ibuprofen can be helpful for pain relief. In some cases, a corticosteroid injection may be used. Physical therapy can be used as well in some cases. And other possible treatments that can be used include transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS, extracorporeal shockwave treatment, and in some very rare cases that are refractory that don't get better, surgical intervention may be used in those cases. If you want to learn more about other musculoskeletal conditions, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.